Our second reading today is from the New Testament in the chapter uh, 10 of the Gospel according to John. In this chapter, John is trying to explain the relationship between him and the people God loves and God has called through him. Starting at chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year during the Easter season, we sing the hymns and speak the language of resurrection. We proclaim the alleluias that will never run out. Our praise is filled with words describing the risen Christ as exalted. Christ is king and God is Lord over all the earth. We rejoice in God's great victory over sin and death, a victory over the laws of nature, if we think about it. We use the language of power. We use the language of majesty. We use the language of glory. Sing, O heavens, and earth reply, we sing. Alleluia. And then on the fourth Sunday of the Easter season, the earth does indeed reply. Today we sing and speak not of heavens, but of the earth. Today, our worship contains images not of thrones and dominions, but of green pastures, of still waters and dark valleys and meandering paths. Today, we sing not about a monarch, but about a shepherd. There is no one more earthy and grounded than a shepherd, especially the kind of shepherd who roamed the hills of Judea in the first century. We may like to imagine shepherds lounging on soft hillocks, playing sweet tunes on their pipes or harps. And no doubt, some shepherds were probably musical. The writer of our psalm comes to mind. But the work of a shepherd was hard, and it was rough. It required strength and endurance for lengthy excursions over rough terrain. It required skill at fighting using the staff to keep predators away from the flock. Wolves, lions, humans, thieves. It required a willingness to forego the creature comforts of even a very modest home for a life lived largely in the outdoors. The work of a shepherd required vigilance. The flock was everything, every sheep, every lamb worth a sacrifice. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says in today's reading from John's Gospel. And he adds, I know my own, and my own know me. Jesus says, they will listen to my voice. There's a powerful bond between shepherd and sheep. And Jesus is claiming just this kind of bond with his beloved people. Now, I grew up uh, in a beachfront suburb So I don't have a lot of first-hand experience with sheep and shepherds. And so in searching this week for descriptions of actual shepherds and actual sheep, I found this reminiscence by somebody named Neil Tolman. He writes, I grew up in Navajo sheep country. I spent my 16th summer out on the arid reservation at my friend's grandparents' sheep compound. My friend was the only one besides me for 20 miles that spoke English. 
I spent most of the summer quietly watching and was inundated with the culture. In my mind's eye, I can clearly see and hear the sound of Roger's little old Navajo grandmother coming out of her log and stone hogan, which is a Navajo dwelling, singing to her sheep. As she hobbled out toward the corral, the sheep raised their heads and began to anticipate the opening of the gate and the cool water she would provide. Grandma waited patiently while the sheep drank their fill. Only after they were well watered did she slowly start down the canyon, softly chanting in Navajo a song that spoke of her love for the sheep. As she led away, as she led the way, the 200 plus sheep eagerly fell in behind and around her. It was quite a sight to watch grandma's bright green velvet shirt bobbing down the canyon, surrounded by waves of white wool. At the bottom of the canyon, she paused and sat on a smooth rock in the early morning shade of sandstone cliffs. The sheep began feeding on the sparse green plants growing in the desert shade. Periodically throughout the day, Grandma got up and sang as she walked to another area where the sheep would feed again. Towards dusk, she would sing the sheep back home. They eagerly followed her to the corral where they were safe from marauding coyotes through the night. The sheep know their shepherd's voice. How does that translate for us? How well do we know God's voice? How do we listen for it? In our first reading from Exodus, Moses, also shepherding a flock, turns aside when he sees something extraordinary, the bush that is burning but which never actually burns up. As he gazes on it, he hears the voice of God, unmistakable, clear. Moses, Moses, the voice calls. And Moses answers, here I am, Lord. Stop right there, God says, and remove your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. And God proceeds to give Moses some startling and not entirely welcome instructions on exactly what it is that God wants Moses to do next. How does Moses know this is the voice of God? Well, one clue is probably that burning bush, something defying the laws of nature right in front of him. But that could be a hallucination, as Ebenezer Scrooge would say, a bit of undigested beef. Anyway, all we know from the reading is that he knows this is the voice of God. And anyway, Moses is kind of a special case when it comes to hearing God's voice. Scripture tells us that he is highly unusual in the face-to-face -face manner in which he and God converse throughout his life. In fact, there is no one else in the whole Bible, not even Jesus, who is described as speaking to God in that way. Certainly, most of us do not have that experience. In fact, when we hear about people who claim that they are speaking face to face with God, we normally rush to get them medical attention as quickly as possible. Still, scripture tells us that we should listen for God's voice. And then it offers us an abundance of options as to just how we might do that. Jesus goes away to pray. Jacob lies down and has a dream. And we can listen for God's voice in our prayer and in our dreams. God is also known to speak to us through the voices of other people. We can watch out for those moments when we just can't shake something that someone has said to us when we wonder whether it might have been God trying to get through. Some people have described a great trauma in their life as being the moment when they were suddenly able to hear God more clearly. And God can certainly speak to us through the news of the day, stir our hearts to prayer, our hands to action, or both. Another coach in this area is the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings, Elijah is on the run because Queen Jezebel has put out a price on his head. 
He has just personally killed 400 prophets of her gods, Baal and Asherah. She's mad. Elijah runs, traveling 40 days and 40 nights, and finally he comes to Mount Horeb, described as the mountain of God. And there he finds a cave. God gives Elijah instructions that he should stand at the mouth of the cave until God passes by. The passage reads, now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. In order to hear the voice of God clearly, Elijah's story suggests, we have to figure out how to open a space in our lives for sheer silence. I think that can be challenging for us, though I can tell you once we begin, we can grow to long for silence. It's very inviting. God loves us and longs for our love in return. So God will find a way to get our attention, whether that means tapping us on the shoulder, smacking us over the head, or setting shrubbery on fire. But in silence, we have the chance to meet God halfway. The care of the shepherd offers us yet another way to hear the voice of God. Let's listen to another bit of Neil's story of life in Navajo country when he was 16. One day, Grandma had to take the long trip into town. My friend and I were asked to take care of the sheep, to take them out for the day. What an education I got. The sheep were not cooperative. We had to drive, push them to where we wanted them. Without the help of the dogs, we would never have moved them away from the river. During the day, we spent a lot of time running after the stragglers. The sheep never did actually settle into grazing, and we had to constantly watch to keep them together. Come late afternoon, we struggled to get the sheep into the corral because they were still hungry and unsettled. Later that night, as we sat tiredly near the fire eating supper, I asked Grandma why the sheep would not follow us. She laughed knowingly and explained, through my friend's interpretation, that she was there when each of these many sheep were born. She sang to them as they were cleaned by their mothers. She went on to say that she was the one that had put their mouth to their mother's milk for the first time. When the mothers were birthing, she had stroked their heads and comforted them. And then she said, they are my children and they know me. Then she paused and looked at me and asked, have you never heard the story of Jesus? Grandma had been a strong presence with those sheep at every moment of their lives. She is the one who soothes the mothers while they labor. She's the one who helps the newborn lambs nurse. She's the one who sings to them while their mothers tend them. Grandma the shepherd is a beautiful image of the God who tenderly cares for us. The God whose voice, when we hear it, will be unmistakable. Every year during the Easter season, we sing the hymns and speak the language of resurrection. We sing and speak of God's great victory over sin and death, over the laws of nature. We use the language of power, majesty, and glory. But on this day, of our Easter celebrations. We sing and speak not of the heavens, but of the earth. Today we sing not about a king who is removed and remote, but about a shepherd who's the king of love. We remember the God who leads us to places of rest and nurture, to havens of stillness and peace. We draw near to the God who comes close to us when we are trembling with fear and who never leaves us alone in that dark valley, but who guides us through it. This is the day when we rest 
in the care of the God who not only restores our bodies and our souls with goodness and kindness, but who leads us on the right path, the path that leads ever homeward. Thanks be to God. Amen.